Good evening, I'm Tomomi Sekia, Head of Event Management at Japan Society. Welcome to the fourth event in the season's Living Tradition webinar series, Japanese Animation and Global Era, co-presented with the Japan Institute of Portland Japanese Garden and supported by the government of Japan. Tonight, we'll start with the presentations by Mr. Mike Toole, Editor at Large at Anime News Network and Professor Thomas Lamar, Department of Cinema and Media Studies, Eastern Asian Languages and Civilizations, University of Chicago. Following the presentations, manga creator Ms. Julia Meckler will moderate the group in a panel discussion and lead the panelists in an audience Q&A. During the program, we invite you all to ask questions by typing them into the YouTube chat. Now, I will turn it over to Mr. Toll to begin his presentation. All right, well, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, uh, my name is Mike Toole. I am the editor at large at Anime News Network and also an associate producer for a home video label called Discotech Media. Uh, welcome to my 15 minute presentation, which is gonna be a little challenging to finish in 15 minutes. So wish me luck there. Uh, now I'm a little uneasy being thrown into the mixer with a distinguished and accomplished academic like uh, Professor Lamar. I'm not a scholar, I'm an enthusiast writer. Usually what I do is I engage with media and then I tell stories about what happened to me. Uh, Japanese anime and manga excites me a lot, and I try to communicate that enthusiasm. I don't really think I'm a top critic or like a leading pundit, but what I am good at, what I try to be good at, is to make anime and manga seem fun. So let's have some fun together. And yes, the photo you're looking at was the most awkward and silly photo of myself I could find. Uh, thanks for taking it, Daryl and Gerald. I ain't proud. So let's uh, let's move forward. Uh, so there were two anime movies that came out in American theaters last week, and uh, I'm wondering if you've seen them, you know which ones they are. Uh, I haven't seen these movies yet, but I'm going to circle back to this spot at the end of my presentation. Uh, in the meantime, I'm going to tell you kind of the story of how theatrical anime made its way from Japan to North America and the rest of the world, the push and pull that has resulted over the decades, uh, highlighting some inflection points and how that has led to today's globally connected world, which is awash with anime at the movies. So uh, we'll move on to the next slide, because the thing about uh, anime movies uh, is you know, a lot of stuff in Japan. It started with trains, and this particular train was part of the Tokyo Railway in the 1940s, the Tokyo Railway, specifically, not Tokyo, Tokyo. Uh, now to move on to the next one, there's the Tokyo logo. Uh, the Tokyo Railway is still a thriving concern today. It's a Keiretsu, one of those uh, you know enormous uh, vertically integrated companies. They're nominally a rail company, but really they're a holding company uh, that contains many other companies. And the fella in the glasses that you're seeing now uh, was Hiroshi Okawa. He was a uh, he was a leading executive at Tokyo. He distinguished himself uh, as the Pacific War Down uh, War War Down uh, by finding ways to consolidate and clear a lot of the company's debt. Uh, and he took interesting risks. He bought a baseball team theorizing that people would take the train to go and see the baseball team. And he was right. Uh, he built convenience stores and grocery stores above his, uh, his railway stations and movie theaters too, because Tokyo had a movie studio, uh, Tokyo Ega, AKA Toei for short, a famous name. And Mr. Okawa was interested in animation. And by 1955, he had a real problem. Uh, he was running out of animated films. He needed more animated movies because they were just about to run out of Disney movies. And uh, moving on to the next slide, we can see that uh, this was a problem he had anticipated because uh, he, he had Tokyo purchase a company, a small animation studio called Nichido. And that company became known as Toei Animation. And Toei Animation, through the late 1950s and into the 1960s, laid the groundwork for a lot of the anime industry that we now know today while making this amazing series of beautiful animated films. And uh, the good part for us Westerners is that theaters in our neck of the woods were also very interested in cartoon movies, too, mainly as Kitty Matinee Fair. And uh, if, you, uh, if you give the slide a bump there, you can see that we got darn near almost every one of Toei's early movies uh, in American movie theaters. Yeah, as you can see. Um, and there were major players in there. If you look really closely, you can see that, uh, you know, MGM was a uh, was a factor and uh big players and small ones got into it uh in the second one you see that columbia pictures they were in on it mgm and smaller outfits too and the thing is 
none of these movies were remotely popular, but they traveled. Uh, they could go all over the place. Uh, if you go to the next slide, even the weird ones. This is a, this is one of my favorites, a movie called Gulliver's Travels Beyond the Moon. Uh, it's uh, It, of course, recounts the amazing adventure of uh, Gulliver from Gulliver's Travels uh, going into space with a little boy and fighting against robots. Uh, but this was uh, this was a first inflection point. Uh, it was it was a matter of Disney and other studios furnishing Japan uh, in the post-war period with animated movies for theaters, creating a demand. And this demand spurred Toei to acquire Nichido, make their own animated studio, and create their own animated movies. Animated movies, which then came straight back over to America and and to other places, which I'll also touch on a little bit. Uh, now, to go to this next slide, not all anime movies created during this period were created equal. Uh, these ones uh, that we're seeing here were made by smaller studios. Some of them were made for an older audience, which didn't really yet exist on a broad scale outside of Japan. Uh, Toei ran the show during this period, and you have to give them credit because um, they, they they knew. If you, go, if you go to the next slide, they were savvy. Uh, you can see some of their marketing material from the period. They knew that this was going to happen, that overseas concerns were going to come looking for their movies. And they were ready. Japan was ready. Uh, they sold their films in the U.S. and they sold their films in many other places, too. And if we uh, go to the next slide really briefly, they even sold the weird ones in places outside of America. Uh, now, moving into the 70s, the demand for kitty matinee fare at the movies, that was waning. The movies were changing in America. Um, but these great films were still showing up in the West. They were showing up on TV broadcasts. Uh, but I want to turn back to Japan for a little bit because a couple of interesting things happened then that kind of happened in parallel to something that was happening in America. So if we go to the next slide, you'll see that in Japanese theaters in the 70s, uh, you had very uh, different kinds of movies. You had Artsy Fartsy Fair by studios teetering on the brink of bankruptcy. You had these blazingly original films by future superstars that were not popular at the box office. And then the big one uh, was something called a space battleship Yamato. Now, all of these movies in their own way fostered a fandom of passionate animation lovers in Japan that were, uh, that, that were not traditional animation audiences. These were uh, older and more sophisticated. None of them accomplished this more so than Yamato. And the Yamato phenomenon developed in some ways that were eerily parallel to a certain American movie. And if we uh, go on to the next slide, that American movie was, of course, Star Wars. Now, Star Wars was not a big hit when it came out. It wasn't a blockbuster on its opening weekend. It actually only opened in a couple of theaters because the studio was terrified that it was going to be a bomb. And uh, also, all the theatrical booking agents were certain that The Other Side of Midnight was going to be the big hit movie of 1977. Who remembers The Other Side of Midnight now? Uh, but anyway, it took Star Wars months of exposure in 1977 to gain the momentum to become a blockbuster. Now, in Japan, the story with Yamato was a little different. Uh, this was a digest version of the TV series with some new stuff. Uh, the TV series actually debuted a few years earlier. It was before Star Wars, 1974. And when it was on Yomiuri TV in its first run, it was not very popular. It was getting its butt kicked every week by Heidi. Uh, but TV in Japan in the 70s was not always a nationally broadcast affair. And Yamato kind of circled the country over the next uh, couple of years. By the time it was available uh, from a lot of stations all over the Kanto region, it was a certifiable hit. And the Studio Office Academy edited the film together uh, from TV footage to capitalize on this. They figured they could run this for a couple of months as a summer roadshow, a few nights here and there in each major city. And the movie made its debut in Tokyo on four screens, and 20,000 fans descended on the theaters in the opening weekend. They had to run the, they had to do the screenings back to back to back all day and night just to satisfy the demand. So obviously, Office Academy were like, oh, we got a hit on our hands. We got we to print some more copies and get these out to more theaters. Uh, but the other theaters had booked this other movie called Black Sunday. Who remembers Black Sunday? Uh, and the bookers, sure enough, were like, well, no, this is going to be the popular movie this summer. You can't have these screening slots. And then someone called in a bomb threat. All of the Black Friday screenings got canceled and opportunity knocked. And that's, uh, that's kind of how these phenomenon developed in parallel, creating a formula for success. Uh, for, for, you know, for kind of in the wake and, and along with Star Wars for Yamato. And uh, here you see another virtuous cycle, another inflection point. Now, Star Wars was not a specific influence on Yamato. It influenced a lot of other anime and manga. But its rise as a phenomenon did help to fuel enthusiasm for seeing the Yamato film. Uh, and Star Wars mania across the globe made Yamato easier to export, uh, as, as we know it, as Star Blazers. 
Uh, now here, uh, we can go into the 80s uh, with Hayao Miyazaki making Nausicaa the Valley of Wind. Uh, Yamato had been a fan-centric phenomenon, kind of a curiosity. Uh, Nausicaa was actually a broad critical hit. It wasn't a massive uh, blockbuster, but uh, it caught more attention overseas. And it got picked up for distribution by uh, Roger Corman's New World Pictures, which hacked a half hour out of it and monkeyed with it considerably. And uh, that was in 1986. That same year, Canon Films uh, used an OVA, a direct-to-video film called Megazone 2-3, to kind of bolt together a Robotech movie uh, under the auspices of a producer named Colm Asik. Now, here was a big hurdle. Uh, American producers were used to tailoring foreign content to their own market. And because of this, Japanese studios had kind of started assuming that American audience did not want rigorous, accurately translated versions of their films. And it would take a while for that stigma to shake off. And uh, strangely, part of that stigma being uh, shed was, was shouldered by the same guy, Carl Masek. Uh, now, if we go to the next slide, you'll see that the Robotech movie failed in test screens. But Masek linked up with a studio hand named Jerry Beck, and they convinced Tokuma Shoten to allow them to screen the Robotech movie and Miyazaki's next movie, Laputa, at a film festival, Animation Celebration, in 1987. Uh, both of these screenings sold out immediately. They sold out faster than any other screenings at the festival. And that led to the pair forming a company called Streamline. And Streamline uh, booked Laputa at several other venues and, and started importing their own movies. They added a film called Twilight of the Cockroaches. And then uh, in mid-1990, Akira. Uh, that was a big moment because Akira was a pretty di uh, big deal, one of the most expensive anime movies ever made, and it caught the attention of critics and the art house crowd. Uh, so the public was ready when Akira came out on videotape in December 1990. Off the shoulder of Akira's success, they had a successful home video company. But how did this feed back to Japan? Well, it kind of took a winding route. Uh, what Masek and Beck did, their secret sauce, was going to the American Film Market Trade Show, uh, where they had their pick of exciting animation for older fare. And that was, the, that was the big secret. They didn't even have to go to Japan. Uh, they just had to go to this film market, and the distributors were waiting for them. Japan was ready. Um, over in the UK, uh, if, you, uh, if you bump it forward, there was a company called Manga Video, and they took a similar approach, even licensing many of the same movies as Streamline, and even in some cases, um, getting materials from Streamline for their own local releases. And now this was not something where the two companies were collaborating. It was kind of a synergistic thing. But manga benefited from ground that was being broken by Streamline. And then manga did something truly audacious, if, uh, if we go to our next slide. And uh, that, uh, that basically entailed taking millions of dollars of their money and investing it in an anime film called Ghost in the Shell. Now, the Western anime business uh, was helping to make anime films directly. And uh, one, one thing I'll say for the record is that Ghost in the Shell uh, actually flopped in theaters. Uh, it was not as popular as they wanted it to be, but it became a cult favorite on home video. The anime world's first global blockbuster was right around the corner, though. And uh, that was, uh, of course, the Pokemon movie. Now, Pokemon is unique from everything else we've talked about here, because most anime movies, when they're exported to overseas markets, only the movie just has itself to sell itself. Uh, but Pokemon was a marketing juggernaut with toys, video games, all kinds of other goodies bolstering awareness. It made $85 million at the box office, which is a record that still stands today. In today's dollars, it'd be about $150 million, which would be good enough to approach the top 10. And imitators follow. Uh, you know, there, there were similar successes of movies as, as carriage for, for product. And, you know, these had wide releases and studio support. They came out from Warner Brothers. The rest of anime cinema in the U.S. wasn't quite there yet, but these successes propped the door open and Sony and DreamWorks and others started experimenting and then Spirited Away won an Oscar, which was quite a thing. Now, Disney had already released several Studio Ghibli movies on video at this point. They acquired rights to the Ghibli catalog uh, from Tokum and Shoten. Uh, but with Spirited Away's success, suddenly Ghibli became a priority for Disney. And this was crucial because up to this point, anime films would take years to get overseas. Uh, but in the 2000s, this meant that uh, fans would kind of shrug and, and pirate them uh, in emerging digital channels. But finally, anime movies were consistently taking less than one year to reach American cinemas. And this also meant that every anime movie was viewed as a potential Oscar contender. That doesn't mean that they were lining up to submit Bleach and Naruto movies uh, for Oscars, but it gave anime publishers another angle to pursue. And uh, this also, you know, is kind of summed up in, the, in the, the technology leaping forward. That tightening window of timing has been the real key that has unlocked the door to anime's worldwide popularity in the current global era. Like network connectivity improved. You can make an entire documentary about how the rise of MPEG-2 video compression codecs drove international anime popularity. 
Um, but basically what it meant for the movie landscape is that instead of uh, cans of film circling the country, there were swifter channels available, and uh, that was going to help anime at the movies grow. Now, to my mind, there were two things uh, that, that driving this forward. One of them were, was uh, film projectors being replaced by digital projectors, which used DCPs, uh, basically glorified hard drives with good encryption uh, to prevent uh, piracy. These were much easier to ship and copy and replace if broken. An average DCP costs a couple of thousand bucks to make initially and is cheap to replicate. Many, many times that is taken for, uh, for film processing and duplication. The 2000s also saw the emergence of Fathom Events, uh, which is basically an on-demand portal where films could be distributed over the internet in 1080i. Now, this wasn't perfect, but it was easy, and crucially, it was inexpensive. And uh, one side phenomenon is uh, these weird films started appearing in American theaters just in one-day city, uh, city engagements. Now, prior to this, anime and American theaters had been kiddie fair, then genre cinema, then prestige stuff. But this wave of movies was specifically geared towards ardent anime fans, so taku. They were designed to tie into existing properties, uh, and, and they were interesting. Some of them did surprisingly well in Japan. The Anohana movie on the left made $10 million, which is a substantial haul for an otaku movie, so American... Uh, film distributors started experimenting with them, just, which is which is pretty cool and another step forward. Now, the big inflection point with the otaku-centric films was the Madoka Magica Rebellion movie. You know, that made almost $20 million in Japan. Uh, and this film didn't still release wide in America. It was only came out in about 35 theaters, but it made a quarter million dollars in a single weekend with a per screen average over $5,000. What that means is that almost every single screening of this movie on that weekend in America was a sellout containing two, three, or 400 viewers. I was at one of those screenings and yeah, it was sold out. So that's pretty cool. And that brings us up towards the present day and the latest virtuous cycle, which is the franchise. Everyone knows about big franchises like Star Wars, Fast and the Furious. Well, Dragon Ball is also a franchise and its reemergence and success in American theaters wasn't a big surprise. People have been waiting for this, but over the course of the 2010s, every new film got more and more popular, going from a couple of single day screenings to a wider opening on 500 theaters, but just on a single weekday, to finally a full-fledged weekly engagement for the most recent film. And crucially, that window of time from Japanese release to American ones started wide, you know, started wide, started over a year for Battle of Gods, but was in a matter of months by, uh, by the time we got to Superhero. That's a key to building that momentum. And I'll also, to the next slide, uh, as, I, as, I, as I start to wrap this up, it's not just Dragon Ball Z. You can see this trend with My or Hey Hero Academia. And uh, I, I use this example because these are not particularly good movies, even by the forgiving standards of Shonen Jump Fair, but they arrive quickly and their theatrical window is brief. So audiences everywhere make time for them and, and they grow. And there's even exponential growth with, uh, with the One Piece movies. Uh, these took a sudden interesting jump up. And I think uh, the availability of the manga, easier access, TikTok videos, uh, this also took a sudden jump in Japan where Stampede's 50 million taking suddenly went to 150 million, and uh, it grew 10 times over in America, too. So kind of the last frontier is the blockbuster, and we kind of had a baby version of one of those. It's hard to explain why this movie, Demon Slayer, took the all-time box office crown in Japan, sweeping aside Ghibli and Shinkai. Maybe it was the pandemic, but not just that. Everyone read the manga, but not just that. Changes in moviegoers' tastes, yeah, but not just that. I think ultimately this is a finely crafted, really accessible film that hit at just the right time, creating a formula for success almost miraculously. And the $50 million it made in the U.S., that's relatively lean takings, but for a mainstream Shonen Jump anime movie, that is absurd. And I think there's going to be a bigger one down the road. So as we wind towards our ending, uh, what is Hollywood feeding back at this point? What's the next inflection point? Well, it kind of looks like this. I'm not convinced this is the right approach. Uh, we've, you know, there have been lots of live action film experiments. They, they don't usually turn out that well. The Battle Angel movie was a good one, but that didn't turn into the massive global hit that the studio wanted. And uh, now we're waiting on a one piece live action TV series from Netflix. Uh, I think that if we get a true anime blockbuster in American theaters, uh, something that pulls over $100 million, it's going to be an animated film and made mostly in Japan. And uh, what's next in theaters? Well, we got an otaku movie. Uh, and we got one that's a little bit more mainstream friendly, and uh, I'll be seeing both of them. And to close off my remarks, uh, this humble little otaku-centric movie about the slime guy, that has made three times as much money as Ghost in the Shell did in American theaters, and it's still running in theaters. So uh, you might want to go see it this week. And uh, that's my presentation. Thank you for listening to my story about anime at the movies in the global era. 
Uh, up next, I think I'm going to pass the baton to Professor Tom Lamar. Thanks. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here tonight and a pleasure to follow Mike Toole. And I'm going to be talking about a somewhat different aspect of anime with a little bit more focus on television, but nonetheless, a lot of resonance with what you just heard. So if we could start into the presentations. So just to introduce myself, my name is Tom Lamar. Um, I teach at University of Chicago. And I want to start out with some of the questions that I always get whenever I teach classes on anime. Usually students come running up to me and they, they really want to know what makes anime popular. Um, and the second question I get in the, in the next slide is anime over. Um, so I can see we're already jumping ahead slides. Um, these two questions together, um, why is anime so popular and is anime over, seem to a lot of fans and a lot of just casual observers devote a lot of time to these. But it seems to imply that anime has some kind of identity or used to have some kind of identity. And I think it's an interesting question, right? People are always trying to figure out what precise the anime is and define it in a certain way. Obviously, when you get more used to these anime markets, um, the closer you get to them, the more diverse they seem, and it gets harder and harder to define anything. But nonetheless, I want to try to answer these questions a little bit, but in a roundabout way. Um, first, by pointing out, like in the second slide, uh, the next slide here, that a lot of times when you read fan commentary, the kind of anime that they think no longer looks like anime tends to be 3D or CGI and to and to use some kind of cell shading or tune shading. Um, and in the next slide, you see a couple other forms of anime that fans often evoke. One would be something like um, cyberpunk edge runners, which looks like anime and kind of fits in an anime market, but really is not so much a Japanese production. And then of course, a more recent um, phenomena known as Chinese anime with fair like heaven's official blessing, where you get something that is looks like anime, but maybe it's not quite anime, but is produced in Japan, Korea, and China um, in a mode that's neither um, outsourcing or co-production. And I think this is always a question when we're looking at um, anime, like if we look at the next slide, for instance, one of the reasons why people uh, try to explain why anime looks the way it does is based on this dispersion of studios. There's a lot of animation studios in Japan. This is the map of the country. And then in the next slide, you'll see the map of the city of Tokyo. Um, it's hard to know precisely what this means, but people often say, because there's so many studios working together in a kind of cooperative manner, certain conventions have arisen for working across studios and producing a kind of coherence between products because not a single studio is ever gonna be responsible for the final look of something. So some kind of conventions have to kick in to allow it to cohere across different production sites. And of course, as I mentioned previously, that means that there's a kind of cooperation in anime industries that really defies usual paradigms of outsourcing and co-production. This does happen. A lot of anime is produced outside of Japan, um, but it's also produced on a model that really doesn't always follow the notion of a typical outsourcing. But to continue with the story of, you know, when we ask why is anime popular or does anime have an identity? There's two things I really want to stress. Um, one is television and the other is what is known as media mix. So first we turn to television media. Um, anime developed its multimedia formats and it's globalized a lot through television or televisual media. And I, I will talk a lot more about this, um, but I'm thinking of television in a really large way, all the way from broadcasting to streaming. And it's really obvious that a lot of the global market has been driven by movement via television. Um, for instance, um, anime will move, first of all, in this televisual form, and then the manga, the games, and other ancillary products will usually follow the anime. And this is especially true when we consider uh, uh, activities in fan worlds, fan subs, and the rest. The fan subs tend to outpace the scanlations and the fan translations of the game. So there's something about the centrality of television that really moves this anime market. And that leads to questions of business strategies. And I want to talk a little bit about that because even though they don't explain everything about anime, they allow us to formulate certain kinds of questions about it. 
So I want to just turn to the next slide, which shows a standard chart, um, well, two slides here that we've just seen. Uh, could you go back two slides? Thank you. So if you look at kind of the charts that are prepared in North America for fan groups, you'll notice how much attention they pay to broadcast schedules. This seems really strange today, right? Like why are we still tracking anime in terms of what time and what date it shows in Japan? We know people don't really watch anime in a broadcast way. I'm sure there are some people who do, but generally speaking, that's not how it works. But this does serve as a kind of reminder um, if we turn to the next slide. Um, that there still is this paradigm of certain conventions associated with televisual production that run through it. And of course, if you look at the kinds of anime, they may look very different, but at the same time, a lot of these shows adopt similar television formats um, all the way down through the way they segment still for commercials and opening songs and whatnot. Um, so then if we turn to the next slide and look a little bit of the production, just say for winter, um, 2023, what's going on right now, you can see an incredible number of television series. Some of them are new series, some of them continuing series, some of them short series, and then movies. But the bulk of the movies that are produced are actually um, precisely what Mike Tool was talking about. They're spin-offs of anime series that are based on manga series. Um, finally, we have this new category called ONA that even includes Netflix. Um, and, but once again, it fits in this kind of televisual history. So what does this mean exactly to look at it this way? Well, when we look at the centrality of television media in anime, um, turn to the next slide, we really get to the question of media mix and how this formation of cross media or transmedia or multimedia franchises arose in Japan. The term media mix for some people is very specific and it refers to Kadokawa studios, particularly in the late eighties and early nineties. But now the term is just used widely to describe this phenomenon of producing a kind of cross media franchising. Um, so if we look at the next slide, we can see, um, and these are from government white papers on profitability of anime. So we'll take them with a grain of salt. But in any case, if you look at these charts, you can see that there are different streams of revenue associated with any anime property. We have television, we have movie, video, general distribution, merchandising, music, overseas, a category called pachinko and the like, which believe it or not is quite important, and also live entertainment. And so if you look at these revenues, it's not always, even though it's not always precisely through the television show that there's the revenue, it is extremely central to making this media mix formation work. I think the next slide shows you a somewhat closer view of the same thing. So you can see a, a bigger proportion now of overseas sales playing into this media mix. Now, how does media mix arise? In the next slide, of course, we see one of the early obvious examples from the 1930s. Some people would trace media mix back to Norokuro when you had a manga that was serialized in a boy's magazine, it turned into animated films at the theater, it produced radio shows, it produced record albums, it produced toys, right? So there's always already the sense that you could begin with a manga property and transform it into multiple properties. But the linchpin there was the animated film in terms of general accessibility. Uh, the next model in the next slide that's often evoked is uh, Tetsuwan Atomu or Astro Boy which formed a media mix quite expressly advertising toys and bonuses and candies alongside both the manga and anime that were running almost in parallel. Um, so in the next slide we see, of course, Astro Boy is a rather weird example because it just continues to expand across media in ways that can't really be controlled anymore by media mix. And perhaps that's another story. But if we turn to um, the next slide, we see obviously Shonen Jump. And Shonen Jump emerges in, in 1968, and it's one of, it's not one of the first manga magazines, but it's building on this energy. And as we already saw with a lot of examples in the previous presentation, Shonen Jump develops a model that is exceedingly successful for moving from manga to anime to other kinds of products. In fact, a glance at Netflix today will show you that this has not changed. 
you're going to see Shonen Jump shows like Naruto, One Piece, Bleach, Chainsaw Man, etc. These, these really still dominate a certain system of distribution. And if we look at the next slide, this is a very simple breakdown of how this is supposed to work. It's much more complicated than it looks because it's not entirely linear. What happens is you have a manga property that is published in a weekly or a monthly or a bi-monthly. It moves then into book form. The book form may move into an anime form. And then the anime form is also sold with other products. But the actual profit system depends on making profit, profit retroactively. The initial versions of this property may lose money. Um, and this could happen for quite a long time. Now, I won't go into all the details of this, although it's interesting, um, but this model is also heavily dependent on reader feedback and is often described as an editorial system where producers and writers and creators and readers are very much bound up into the production of the products. But I want to evoke yet another example to give you a sense of how it works in the next slide. Um, an older but classic example, Captain Tsubasa, and this is an interesting example because we begin to see a certain kind of reading practice. We have a manga being serialized in a weekly magazine, and at the same time it's popular, so it's being released in book form. So it means readers are reading the same manga on different timelines. They may be reading both, they may be reading one or the other, and at the same time an anime series that's exceedingly popular comes out at the same time and increases the readership. So we almost have three different ways of reading Captain Tsubasa at the same time in the mid um, 1980s. And so on the next slide to continue with this, there's also anime films. So it begins to expand into other markets. And of course, we could even consider Captain Tsubasa being one of the most important shows for the emergence of Yaoi or boys love e Komiketo because Sisubasa became one of the fan favorites among young women. In other words, this is a really complicated pattern of serialization, but you can see how it gradually expands and feeds back on itself. But if we think about one of the challenges this produces in the next slide, um, you get to a point where these series are running simultaneously, but you're at different stages or phases of what feels like it should be one story at the same time. So by the time you get to a certain point in the summer of 1985, in fact, Captain Tsubasa is playing games in different leagues across the world in different places and they're different ages. So how, what do you do with this? Um, sometimes this is just treated as you don't need to worry about it. Sometimes it's treated as a contradiction and people try to figure out what the canon is, what, what really belongs into these series. And sometimes it's used as a possibility so as we can see in the next slide, one of the ways of dealing with the strange effect of serialization is to develop divergent series. The Ghost in the Shell series has series in which you have a world in which the puppet master exists and then world when the puppet master doesn't exist. And so you can begin to serialize stories within a world rather than focus on a single story with contradictions. So this brings us into the question that I think is really interesting with this kind of franchising that's so heavily dependent on television me uh, media is that multiple stories are possible within the same world. And sometimes in Japan, these are called world lines, right? You can traverse um, an anime or expanded television world through different world lines. So it's in this way we get to the I think a really interesting way of thinking about the popularity of anime, which is precisely the question of worlds. So uh, next slide. So if we think about world, how is world actually used within the framework of manga and anime and other forms of production in Japan? Well, we can use a simple current example. In the next slide, we see Chainsaw Man, which is a shonen jump manga that's been turned into an anime and has ancillary media. Um, I think it even has food products, which seems quite bizarre, but there it is. But when we consider these kinds of products um, and how they're conceptualized in the next slide, we can think about this. These are terms very commonly used, particularly in the manga industry, but also in the anime industry, where we have three parameters. We have a character, we have some kind of premise, and then we have a world. And the character or characters have certain kinds of attributes, and we know that this will extend all the way from character design into voice acting. 
But the actual premise or the setup involves a certain kind of place, like certain kinds of story premises, but also heavily dependent on place. But when people think about worlds in production, they don't associate the world with simply a place or a setting. The world is what emerges through the interaction of the character with this premise and place. So as a character moves in a certain way, in a certain kind of place, it produces the world. But the world can't really be identified as one single place, which means you could pick up this character and provided you keep the premise, you could write your own version, your own story through the same kind of world. So I think it's this kind of setup where what's being serialized is not only the character and not only a story pattern and maybe not even a setting, but part of what's being serialized is a world. Now studios, if we take the example of Chainsaw Man in the next slide and you go to their website, there is a kind of awareness of this. The website presents itself with certain kinds of relation to anime series. Um, I hear you see some of the ones that were produced in uh, 2023 and you may know some of them. And if you look at the next slide, you can see how one of the animes for the studio, Mappa, which is an offshoot of Madhouse, um, called Campfire Cooking Another World with My Absurd Skills, is already folding different kinds of products into the video feeds that are running through its website, right? So it's producing certain kinds of world effects and then gives you ways of relating to these foods through the absurd skills. And if you look down in the lower corner, you'll see then there's also a link for an event for Chainsaw Man, which is my final slide here. Um, where there's got a marketing strategy that's producing events for fans with different kinds of encounter with the anime series and with the expanded television media. And even though I've been putting a lot of emphasis, of course, on the way in which producers and perhaps marketers are thinking about this, I don't think this question of world really stops there. When we see these kind of phenomena that the producers are so aware of, there is a consciousness that world is what has to be serialized. And so if we're going to think about something like the future of anime or the identity of anime, or even as anime over, we really have to think more about the question of world because the anime is never going to be just a visual style or a story pattern. Its future is gonna depend on whether these worlds can be sustained and these multiple storylines can run through them. So I'd say on this basis, um, whether you like contemporary anime or not, I think it's pretty clear that anime worlds still have a future. And I'll end on that note, thank you. All right, what a pleasure it is to be here with Mike and Tom to talk about the globalization of Japanese anime. Also, I would like to thank the Japan Society for allowing me to host this and for bringing us all together today. Anime is a passion for me and its growing fan base around the world. Growing up as an American Japanese mixed person in Japan, traveling both countries often, I watched anime start to become a global phenomena. The biggest change I have seen since then, however, was due to the rising popularity of streaming services in the 2010s. This media mix resulted in a demographic shift of millennials and Gen Xers consuming anime from just cable TV to cross-platform consumption via Netflix, Hulu, and more. The otaku culture seems to be ever more popular in the US with a growing fan base, more marketing spending by anime film productions, and the media mix approach becoming the standard. With that, I would like to start with some questions about fan culture. Um, so the access to the internet has enabled fans all over the world to watch anime in real time and the demand has risen accordingly. Do you think that benefited or helped the anime industry in terms of how fans value content? Um, uh, Professor Tom, would you like to answer that question? Um, thank you, it's a really good question. And I think it's so complicated because um, like one of the moments where I really became aware of the effect of Netflix was when Yuasa Masaaki's series, um, Devilman Crybaby, became hugely popular. He's the director I like. I think of him as a director who's very much more appreciated by fans than by mainstream audiences. 
But suddenly we had a director, I think, who has stylistic flair, a real vision and a sense of control of what he wants to achieve, achieving a kind of popularity. But um, I think this had a positive effect on fan communities because on the one hand, there's this feeling of, ha, we were right already. And also we know more about Yuasa Masaaki and we can expand our fan wikis and our fan bases. So I would say in cases like that, there's, there's a real feedback. And I find, as you say, with a new generation of anime viewers, there's less stigmatization of fan activities. And so people very quickly get off Netflix. Netflix doesn't really hold people 24 seven the way they would like to think it does. So in fact, I've, Personally, I feel like there's been an expansion of fan activities. I guess the question is, is how fan activities still manage to do certain things in a gray legal zone and fly under the radar, right? Without running into conflict. Um, but I'd also be interested in hearing what Mike thinks about this. He, he has hands-on experience with some of these. Oh yeah. I would love to hear from Mike, yes. Yeah, yeah. Like a lot of professionals in the in the anime industry outside of Japan, I got started as a fan who shared and pirated content on my own. I even worked on a couple of fan subs back in the day. But uh I think that I think you know the, the explosive growth has has done some interesting things to expectations. Uh because fa fans now, like I said, they first requested and then demanded that material uh be available to them within days or hours of uh of coming out in japan i think this is a uh, this is this is allowed growth uh for for the industry outside of japan but it, it's also put a strain on things as as they as, as as these companies seek to bring in more and more uh translators and localization staff and and try to expand and grow uh you know while while uh while, while trying to manage their costs uh, that that's one interesting effect uh the other thing that always strikes me when I think about anime's global uh, global popularity now is uh, I think that, you know, driven largely by fan demand and by how vocal fans are, they're making too much of it. They're making, uh, you know, almost four times as much uh, TV anime as they made back in the 80s and early 90s now. And uh, I fear that, uh, you know, while, while we might have something unusual like Devilman Crybaby becoming a big crossover hit, uh, I worry that the, you know we're still having great shows being produced that are being overlooked because there's just so much of it now. I agree with you, and this leads back to the question that I, another question I have for both um, Tom and Mike: the anime industry is facing a serious and growing understaffing problem with growing demand in production. Despite the growing demand, the data from 2020 to 2022 suggests that nearly 40% of the anime production companies are in deficit in Japan. And it seems like the companies that are doing well are the ones producing anime with Netflix, Amazon, and other global, well, mainly American platforms. Do you think this will change the content of the anime? Um, for example, like take away the uniqueness of made in Japan, like true made in Japan anime? Um, I guess I will ask Mike first. <laughs> Well, I think that it, it, in some ways that that is maybe a problem and that that concerns me as someone who grew up with the idea of, of anime as sort of a uh, categorical term where it's oh, it's it's a descriptive term for, for animation from Japan. But we now have animation being produced in China in South Korea, even in America in the West that looks and feels like Japanese anime. Uh, so that's that's definitely something interesting that's coming up. Um, I think that. Uh, I think that you know there's definitely a possibility of a, of anime becoming less Japan centric simply because, thanks to the the deficit in animators in Japan, studios are looking beyond. They're hiring they're hiring freelancers uh, from outside, from from Vietnam, from uh, from China, from India, from from really all over, uh, in, including plenty of people in the West. Um, so that's uh, that, that's one thing that's happening. Uh, I, I think that uh, animator, you know, the wages uh, that, that the animators make on the bottom rungs that needs to come up. Uh, I don't know how they're going to accomplish this. Uh, intellectually, I think that what is needed is a widespread labor strike. I think that uh, delaying the supply of anime for a few weeks may actually finally turn some heads. But that's a big lift now, just because they're making so much of it now. There's so many segments of so many different creative industries engaged in creating it so how do you uh how do you get them all together with with their hands on the same crowbar trying to get that attention you know 
And working in Japan, growing up in Japan, I know strike is like unlikely to happen in Japan. So I don't know how to um, fix that problem. But uh, going back to the identity of anime, uh, Japanese anime, uh, Professor Tom, do you think that made in Japan anime will ever lose its market share and be replaced by other Asian countries animation such as Chinese, Korean, like uh, Mike mentioned earlier? Um, if so, will the genre still be anime? Does the word anime only apply to anime produced in Japan by Japanese studios? Yeah, it's a great question. And I wanted to build a little bit on what Mike was saying as well. I, th I think what's, what's difficult about this moment is whether anime is defined as animation produced in Japan or as government initiatives would like to say, <laughs> animation is a design and a concept produced in Japan, not a physical act of labor. Now, that has interesting possibilities in terms of creativity because what it's doing is defining anime really as design and conceptualization rather than as a form of labor. The problem is, as Mike pointed out, I mean, the, the, the labor for anime in Japan is shocking, right? Like what people are paid and the level of exploitation and the willingness to outsource animation to even cheaper sources. But this is this is a new this is a battleground that's very familiar to us even outside the anime industry where a lot of works are being redefined in information related industries in terms of concept and design rather than physical labor. So it doesn't surprise me this is happening to anime, um, and I don't think I know how this will play out. But it is interesting to me that that's 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 become the site of conflict. Are we really gonna think of this animation in terms of the physical labor going into it? Or are we really going to celebrate the design features? And that, that goes back again to not just the, you know, the workers in the animation industry, but it is an industry, as Mike was pointing out too, that's heavily dependent on the work of fans. And you know, that's, that's, if you will, um, a, a different kind of sense of enlarged labor that I think the industry has to openly acknowledge if it is going to continue to function. Yeah, if I may cut in very briefly, I'll say that this is something that I found to be true inside Japan and outside. Anime uh, in many ways has done so well in the past few years because nobody's getting paid on time. That's what I think. Well, that's um, a sad issue that the anime industry is facing. And um, I have another question about that um, on the topic of the understaffing and deficit problems in the anime industry. Many Japanese anime fans have criticized a phenomenon called sakuga hokai, which is horribly drawn anime stills um, and the lower quality in recent anime. Um, do you think the global audience sees the same problem with the recent Japanese anime? And how would you suggest the anime industry to fix that problem? Um, I guess, uh, Mike, I'll have you answer that. And then, uh, Professor Tom, if you have um, insight in that, please let me know. Well, the phenomenon of, of Sakuga Hokai, is, it's, it's dear to me in some ways because it's very compelling stuff. It's, it's often raw and interesting and also a little bit melancholy to see what is unmistakable evidence of a production kind of falling apart and losing its way. Um, as far as as pushing back on that, like uh, globally, I think fans are taking notice of that because of these tiny windows for simulcasting that we now have. And, and there are some shows that uh, in recent seasons, story-wise, that have been absolutely fine. Like there's an adaptation of a manga series called uh, Lucifer and the Biscuit Hammer, where the, the animation is not terrible, but it's a little bit subpar. It, it really should be better. And uh, I think that the only way to solve that problem is to maintain the same amount of resources and labor and revenue and, and money coming in but make fewer productions and uh, no one seems to want to do that professor tom do you have any insight yeah i mean i think um you know to add to that i mean part of it depends on how we're going to look at anime it's it's clear that <clears throat> there's a there's a change in form and i i think i showed a couple examples in my presentation that people have pointed to that really in a way lack a middle ground um, because you don't need it with certain kind of computer techniques. You can just, you can kind of fudge all these, all these relations between foreground, middle ground, et cetera. And it can produce something that looks really bad, but then 
you know, I'm always hesitant to, to instantly write off what looks bad at a certain historical period. I, I, you know, I think we need the creativity so people find the possibilities. There are moments in certain shows where I find it's used for comedic effect quite well. Um, so yeah, I don't want to get too caught up in, you know, there's a certain kind of standard that animation has to look like because we've been through these battles over and over. Um, but I think the real key is to what extent are these new techniques or shorthand ways of producing anime going to produce a new form of expression? Well, interesting, because I'm getting um, questions from the audience related to the same topic we're discussing right now. So at this point, we would like to take some questions from the audience. We have been compiling questions from the chat. So we'll start with those. Um, if you have anything you would like to ask the panelists, please enter your question in the chat now. Okay, so one of the questions, um, there are a lot of anime being produced every season, but many are rather formula formulaic and bland. What compels studios to create such titles? Um, I guess, Mike, do you have any? Well, uh, you can look to the markets of manga and light novels, uh, which also follow, follow trend lines that, that make them seem a little bit samey at times. And the way a lot of anime is financed and produced is done by a, a production committee, by committee, by several different companies, all pitching and resources. And usually what happens at the genesis of these productions is uh, representatives from these companies all they have a meeting and they sit down and they look at each other and they say well this light novel seems to be doing well so an anime based on it will probably be popular and i think it's really as simple as that um you know an anime is in, is in many ways just a reflection of other media and uh if it's uh, if some of it is is kind of bland and, and skewing the formula i think it's because that other media is what is popular right now and and across uh across all japanese media at the moment uh, the, the genre of isekai of, of characters being flung into another world that's extremely popular right now and so it's very easy to fall into the trap of watching all these different shows that just kind of feel the same and uh, that's what i think is driving it Yes, and um, even on manga or webtoons, I see a lot of isekai um, genre happening right now. So I think it's not just anime, it's like Japanese content and um, overall is going with the bland <laughs> topic. Um, so anime, so this goes back to how anime is produced in Japan. Um, it's under Iinkai. Um, um, they the bunch of companies get together and decide like mike said so anime has recently begun to embrace crowdfunding as a viable solution to funding production of series how do you think this will impact the industry in the future uh professor tom yeah, that's that's really hard to answer but i guess i would try to find an answer through the previous discussion um in in some ways this you know, I think there's something like six to 700 anime series produced a year now, which is a phenomenal amount. And a lot of it has to be conventional. I'm just not sure how all of that would be exceptional and creative. Um, but I think if we think about it, obviously it's tracking what's popular in the market in Japan and allowing fans to say, continue with a light novel or continue with a manga or continue with a game in another form. But it also makes a curious kind of sense in terms of the way in which these franchises have worked historically. It's always kind of assumed that serialization is never finished. And say you do a crappy anime version of a manga today, if someone does a good one in the future, they're gonna go back and watch the crappy one. And so there's, there's a way in which the serialization involves a profit feedback where the immediate quality and profit are not necessarily evident. And there's ways in which things that are garbage today turn out to be treasured tomorrow. So it almost feels like it's built into the system. In other words, the, the way it's going to operate to have a kind of surplus of product produced of varying quality, and then it plays out in different ways. So with crowdfunding, I think it raises the bar. Like it's, it's really asking for a different model of profit in that you're, you're putting all your eggs in one basket. <laughs> Right? Like you're, you're really trying to fund something more like a movie that'll be a standalone that's going to hold its own and not something where future entries may possibly make it profitable. And, and that's still the power of these huge publishing houses versus, if you will, crowdfunding. 
I, um, let me see, I have more questions from the audience. Uh, are there any studios playing with AI generated animation? Mike, do you have, do you know anything about that? Well, it's it's funny to contemplate. To, to that, I would say, well, uh, a lot of studios use the 3D animation program Maya. And in Maya, you can set up your 3D model, rig it up for motion, set your camera, define your keyframes, and then Maya will create all of the in-betweens. So is, is that AI generated animation? I think in a certain sense it is. Uh, I think the popular discussion about AI is now more about, uh, well, can can machines create content? Can, can they create compelling stories and images just with a prompt or with barely any human input at all? Uh, I don't think that's the case. Uh, I don't I don't think we're there yet. And I think it's going to be very hard to really get there. I think we've uh, we've got some programs and tools that have gotten uh, good at making convincing simulacra of uh, of AI, but I don't think we're really close enough to uh, to influencing production in any way. I agree with you. I was working in a game production company um, recently, and there was AI tools that we considered using, but it wasn't realistic to apply. So, um, all right, going back to more questions. How has transnationalism and localization played a role in this global era? What do you think gets lost in localization? Uh, Professor Tom? Well, I think localization historically, when it's done by production studios, cuts two ways. Uh, people often get that in Hollywood, the interest of having new voice actors and people cutting and adding footage is you gave people jobs and people had jobs in a union. So when you simply take content and translate it, you, you don't have the same kind of job base. So localization I think is tricky, right? Because in some ways people see it as a simple cultural problem. Like we're translating Japanese culture into another culture, but a lot of times it's really a studio mediation and they're not necessarily thinking of just saying, oh, let's make it American. They're thinking about using certain kinds of skill sets and pushing it through a certain kind of production system. So I think this is why when we go back and look at some examples Mike evoked like Robotech and the rest, they may seem awful in some ways, but they have a curious logic to them that still give them a fan base. And I think that speaks to not simply they were being made into American shows, but they were actually working with anime that are open enough that you can create storylines within worlds. I would just consider Robotech part of an expanded world. Okay, I think I'll ask the last question from the audience. Uh, we've seen several high profile acquisitions by Japanese companies of American companies, Sony and Crunchyroll, Kadokawa and ANN. What impact do you think this will have on the global market, Mike? Well, I think that uh, too much consolidation is a bad thing in terms of uh, of Sony uh, by you know kind of kind of hoovering up uh, so many of its uh, competitors, simply because that's 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 kind of a threat to the diversity of media and the diversity of channels that that can push the media to the people. Um, you know, I, I don't I don't want it to get uh, too samey. I, I don't want it, everything to be run by a single company that, uh, like any other company, is is in many ways going to be risk averse. You know, uh, part of part of why I got caught by Japanese animation was because there were so many uh, creatives in that medium who were who would take risks. And I worry that too much consolidation would kind of cut into that. Um, I'm, I, I don't really have the answer to that, but uh, that, that is that is something that concerns me that I think that uh, if, if there's too much consolidation and only a couple of companies calling the shots, then anime might become less interesting. And I think that would be too bad. Yes, and that, that goes back to the concern one of our audiences had about um, anime being bland, like based on light novels, all the anime is being based on light novels, etc. I think okay. there's, a, there's a consensus we're building here where we're, we're a little worried about anime losing its Japanese-ness. Yes, know? yes. Yeah. But also its fan base, because I, I'm, I'm sure Mike remembers this as well, but really what I associate streaming services with anime fan sites because it got to the point you couldn't download all the pirate anime so people offered streaming services and Crunchyroll emerges from that and you know this kind of more democratized form of streaming allowed people a lot of creativity with subtitles with curation um, and I think that's what disappears um, 
it's not just the corporate, it's the IP problem, right? That everything mm -hmm. becomes intellectual property and that's the end of the story. Well, unfortunately, that's all the time we have. I wish we could go on. We could go on and on about this topic, but um, we, we don't have enough time anymore. So thank you, everyone who has joined us for the virtual program. And we apologize if we didn't have time to get to your question. Uh, before we wrap up, I'd like to turn it back over to our panelists to share any final thoughts. Uh, Professor Tom? Uh, no, you caught me by surprise. I don't <laughs> <laughs> I don't have final thoughts, um, but, but thank you. It's been a pleasure to um, be in conversation with both of you. Uh, how about Mike? Do you have any final thoughts? Oh, absolutely. I think it's an incredibly exciting time to be an anime fan, to be involved in any way, even as a fan uh, to the anime business. Uh, this, the air is still crackling with possibility, and uh, I'm going to the movies on Friday to see that Sword Art Online movie. Oh, exciting. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you again to our panelists, uh, Mike and Tom, and thank you to all of our audience members who are joining us from around the world tonight. If you have a moment, please fill out a short survey about this program. You can find the link in the chat. We appreciate your feedback. We will be announcing new programs in the Living Tradition series soon, so please check the Japan Society website for announcements. We hope you can join us then as well. Have a good night.